when I started training, uh, we hardly ever saw early prostate cancer. Prostate cancer was considered a metastatic disease, um, usually in older men, uh, and no one really addressed primary treatment because we never made the diagnosis early enough. Historically, the treatments for men with prostate cancer were essentially two treatments, and they were both uh, directed at the whole gland. One was radiotherapy and the other was surgery. So the only option uh, against those would be no treatment at all. Previously we've had this issue of whether patients need to be subjected to the side effects associated with radical treatments that are well documented, incontinence, erectile dysfunction and bowel dysfunction. And, but we've also had in the back of our mind, well is it safe to leave these patients alone? Is it safe just to watch them and see? As men have uh, survived the uh, ravages of cardiovascular disease and uh, their general lifestyles have improved, uh, prostate cancer has become a greater and greater threat to men. And as a result, we've developed techniques which are ongoing and uh, evolved to make early diagnosis possible and more recently, uh, diagnosis of where the disease is in the prostate. Now with imaging and coupling imaging to biopsies, we're, we're directing the biopsies towards the area of interest and we can now have information on the location of the tumour within the prostate. And that allows us to treat men in a focal manner, in other words, directing the, the, the treatment to the cancer rather than directing and designing the treatment around the prostate. As we get better and better at diagnosing, uh, we uh, understand the disease and the natural history of the disease better and we can advise men both in terms of indolent cancers that really probably don't need treating at all to aggressive disease that certainly needs radical uh, treatment and then we have the plethora in the middle and the beauty of focal therapy is it offers a third way uh, which should suit a great majority of men with a disease that is moderate, uh, significant, but focally treatable. That sounds fairly revolutionary in the prostate, but indeed we've done it in all other organs. Uh, we've done it in the breast, we've done it in, in the kidney, uh, we've done it in penile cancer. The process by which you determine A, whether a patient is suitable for focal therapy and B, where the disease is and uh, how to treat it is twofold. That is the uh, specific MRI and the template guided biopsy prior to the procedure. Uh, and then you need an energy that you can deposit uh, into the lesion. Uh, and there are a number of contenders for that and, um, and, and we have a growing number of, of types of energy. The one that we've been using now for several years and have a lot of confidence with is using sound waves and concentrating the density of those sound waves into certain parts of the prostate. Uh, and that's called high intensity focused ultrasound or HIFU. And the nice thing about that is that you can do it and treat patients in a relatively non-invasive manner. I started with high intensity focused ultrasound as a whole gland technique. And in fact, it had excellent results. Previously, I did whole gland uh, high food, both in the salvage setting and in the primary setting. Uh, but now I've concentrated really entirely on focal high food. With focal high food, I'm relatively new to this as part of the clinical trials designed by Mark Amberton at UCH. And the Royal Marsden is one of the centers that have joined in. And we've treated a number of patients now and recruited a considerable number. High intensity focus ultrasound is delivered through a probe uh, via the rectum. It's a non surgical technique in that no cuts are involved. And it delivers the sound waves to pinpoint accuracy uh, and it generates heat which destroys the tissue. And that is controlled uh, using an image system based on ultrasound to map the prostate. HIFU is done under general anaesthetic. I've seen it done under regional anaesthesia, uh, but you really want your patient very still. Uh, you're, you're looking at um, millimeter to millimeter accuracies because you're depositing energy in a phasic manner and you don't want that prostate to move. So this treatment's going very well. My task is to get sufficient energy to um, create energy densities at the focal point 
that are around 900 watts per square centimeter, 1,000 watts per square centimeter, uh, with the exposure density at 35 watts per square centimeter. And that's the process of concentrating energy. We can see the changes in the tissue, what we call popcorning, verifying that we're achieving temperatures in the order of 90 to 100 degrees, which exceeds the threshold to achieve irreversible cell death. From the patient's perspective, um, uh, it really is very smooth. They come in in the morning, uh, they have their treatment, and they go home in the afternoon. And um, very few patients don't fulfill that, that pathway. Uh, they have a suprapubic catheter in for a few days afterwards because there is inevitable swelling of the prostate. Um, but that catheter normally comes out a few days later or they start voiding, you know, 24 to 48 hours after that. Most patients, I have to say, uh, go home the same day. Uh, some of them playing golf the following day, walking the dogs, etc. There really is minimal impact on quality of life. Patients are followed up in a similar fashion, fashion to most radical treatments, uh, usually with a quarterly assessment with examination or PSA and uh, a six month or annual um, scan uh, to see how the tissues have changed. And usually there's a re-biopsy as a final arbiter of uh, whether or not the lesion has been resolved. It's early days yet, I have to say that, uh, and the maximum length of follow-up I've got is uh, just over a year. But in terms of the, seeing the MRI scan afterwards and seeing the MRI before, it's very reassuring. Before you see the tumour on the MRI scan, after the treatment, the repeat MRI scan shows a big black hole where that tumour was. You know, therefore, that tumour must have gone. Uh, the PSA results have all been very promising. They've all uh, dropped by more than half and very often less to less than one. It just depends on the amount of prostate you destroy, really, and how much benign tissue you're leaving behind, which, of course, will go on making PSA. In terms of cancer control rates, most of the focal therapy studies show about a 90% freedom from clinically significant disease at the time of evaluation, and we do that at about a year. Men, from a functional perspective, were indistinguishable pre-treatment versus after treatment, so virtually 100% continence and about 90% at restoration of erectile function at six months to a year. HIFU probably works for about 80% of the patients that I treat, and then either patients are ineligible because they have calcification, or I can't reach the lesion and I'll be looking for other forms of treatment. What's interesting about focal therapy, and certainly in the trials that we've done so far, is that recruitment hasn't been a problem. I think that focal therapy uh, offers a considerable amount of men that were given active surveillance as their only really uh, sensible option over and above radical treatment, the opportunity of a therapeutic intervention. Well, most patients are very keen to avoid the unpleasant side effects of radical treatment. But the in instinct is when you have a cancer diagnosis, you want to have treatment for it. So most patients are absolutely delighted to be offered a treatment without the inherent side effects, but with the advantage of probably being cured of your disease. I think the awareness of HIFU and of focal treatment is expanding. The number of uh, talks at uh, our urological community meetings, uh, both nationally and internationally, now addressing this issue. Uh, so I think every urologist should know about focal treatment for prostate cancer. Some people still have concerns about missing significant tumours. Uh, and there will always be those who say the only way really is for radical prostatectomy, for people all to be treated with surgical excision of the prostate gland. That will never change. The, the, the breast surgeons had exactly the same discussions 25 years ago. The notion of um, experimental or unproven is important and, and a lot of people say that about the treatment. And, and, uh, and I think it's just worth pausing and reflecting to, where are the uncertainties. There's no uncertainty in terms of safety. This is a very safe procedure. We've done it enough men now to know that that's the case. There's no uncertainty in terms of restoration of um, genital urinary function, in terms of continence, sexual function, including erections and ejaculation, very well documented in all our studies. And there's no uncertainty in terms of the cancer control rates at one to two years, again, very well documented. So the only element of uncertainty, of, of, of lack of proof, 
is the downstream natural history of the disease. And for that, we just have to wait. There is no way of conjuring up that data. So uh, when people say it's experimental, um, it's only experimental in terms of the downstream consequences. Um, in, other, in other words, what happens five to 20 years on. Focal HIFU is a uh, very reproducible, relatively low-cost treatment uh, that is easily uh, uh, delivered and allows uh, a quick and fast recovery. So I think that this should be and it will be uh, available to men on the NHS. There is still um, a postcode lottery and, and people only get the treatments they are offered unless they actually seek out those treatments themselves. Uh, we have a terribly long waiting list at UCLH, uh, largely as a result of people coming from all over the country, so we're desperately um, in need of uh, greater capacity to treat these men. Uh, we're doing that through multi-centre studies and training up other units to do that. We're doing that through partnerships with other hospitals and helping them get up to speed so they can treat in a focal manner. And I think that will be, in some way, mitigate um, some of the problem. A focal high food should be cheaper than doing a radical robotic prostatectomy, not only in terms of the uh, costs of the consumables, but also in terms of length of stay, because patients could go in and out in a day. Um, so I think from the hospital, the cost benefit is, is greater, having a focal treatment. In terms of delivering the treatment, um, one uh, can treat about three or four patients in a day, as the treatment tends to take about an hour and a half to two hours. So. Uh, HIFU does allow you to schedule more patients than would be otherwise possible with, say, surgery, which I think two would probably be a maximum. Actually getting the kit in is relatively straightforward. It's very mobile. Uh, the technician arrives with the kit, with a proctor, uh, and it's relatively straightforward to setting up on a normal operating theatre, on a normal operating list. I think the rate-limiting step in terms of uh, rolling it out in the NHS is actually the trained staff. That is uh, staff that are good enough to interpret MRI and do adequate studies uh, so that you can actually um, isolate the patient or identify the patient and the lesion effectively. And also to train up surgeons who can deliver uh, the treatment effectively and safely. I think that will be the rate limiting step rather than expense. I did 30 odd hours of training and I'm very happy now to do focal therapy on my own. If you're used to doing ultrasounds of prostate and if you do prostate biopsy then you are, then actually learning the technique is not very difficult. Focal therapists have, have used the energy source they're comfortable with. Uh, and possibly more importantly, the energy source that's available. So in the United States, most focal therapy is done with ice, with cryotherapy. In Europe, uh, we've used principally high-intensity focused ultrasound or HIFU. And that's what we've used and I've used and we've published upon. The only other focal therapy I have experience of is with PDT, photodynamic therapy. Uh, and I think that's a good treatment. It's a very neat way of treating people. And people are looking at perhaps focal seed implant brachytherapy. Uh, and there's electrovaporization, which is a very new technique as well. I'm uh, quite interested at the moment in um, electroporation or nano knife as a non thermal energy source, uh, and we're getting some very nice results off study yeah. using special consenting and about to start a formal study at UCLH uh, once we get final ethical approval. There are others. Um, one is thermal laser, which is done inside the MRI and again showing good, early, promising results from three centres that are using it. Uh, but HIFU certainly seems very reproducible and has been around for quite a considerable time. And the beauty of it is that it has a very controlled delivery. And some of the other techniques struggle with that, in particular cryotherapy. I think focal therapies will find a very strong place in terms of prostatic cancer treatment. There will still be a role strongly for active surveillance in a certain group of men and equally there will be a strong role for radical treatment both in terms of radical surgery or radical radiotherapy. But I think the vast majority of men who present with the disease 
will have the opportunity of considering focal treatments. We're getting good long-term or medium to long-term results now showing that it's a safe procedure both in terms of cancer cure and in terms of morbidity and I can see that we're going to treat more and more patients uh, this way rather than radically. I'm a clinician scientist, I'm, a, I'm an investigator and, uh, and I think this is a, a really valid area to, um, to investigate. Why? Because I think the opportunities for benefit are enormous. Um, why? Because I think we may be able to design a treatment that can treat men with prostate cancer with almost no side effects. And then the issues of overdiagnosis, which are very prevalent today, and more importantly, the issues of overtreatment become l much less serious if we can administer a treatment that has almost zero negative consequences, and importantly, is, is relatively cheap to administer.